and uh, we'll, we'll talk loud. They're going to work on turning the music down a little bit here, so hopefully you can hear us over it. Otherwise, if, feel free to get up and move and, and sway to the music. Um, so as, as Laura mentioned, we have a long history. Um, I've spent the last 20 years on campus uh, in different career services roles and switched over to corporate relations where I now work in the College of ACES and I'm learning uh, more and more about agriculture. And, and this panel is, is really exciting to me to be able to blend both the college uh, the agriculture uh, kind of uh, career paths um, with that background that I have in, in uh, in uh, career development with our students. Um, I feel like I have to keep talking louder, so hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Okay, great. We've all prepared a river dance uh, number that, no. <laughs> it's almost St. Patty's Day. It seemed like an easy joke to go for, but. It would be cool if it was a flash mob and we just had one person start and. Yay! Great. Um, again, thanks, thanks for joining us after lunch and uh, bearing with us as we turn down the music and get started. Um, you know, when we think about the challenges in the ag industry and the, the workforce is a topic that always comes up. And the future of the ag tech workforce is really important. We've got ongoing labor shortages, diversity of our our talent pools, um, skills gaps, and the needs to meet this this rise, this different generation of expectations in the workplace. And so, those are just a few of the topics that we're going to talk about today. And uh, you know, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but tomorrow is International Women's Day, and so I'd really like to acknowledge the amazing um, panel of women in ag. Um, that are making a difference now and in the future of our, our ag tech um, supply. Um, so we've got Laura Gerstner, who's the Director of Precision Tech Enterprise Program Management at CNHI. Jen Quinlan, Food and Agritech Innovation Program Lead at Cargill. Amy Funk, who's the Director of the Jackie Joyner Kersey Foundation's Agriculture and Nutrition Innovation Center. And Maggie Brickerman, who's the partner with Generator. So we've got a wonderful panel of experts. So thank you for being here today. Um, I'd like to kick off our panel discussion with a, a pretty broad question around where you see the greatest need for talent and then what you think the challenges are to filling those roles. Um, so I'm going to let Jen kick that one off. Excellent. Well, uh, again, I'm Jen Quinlan with Cargill. Um, through my role here in Research Park, so I am a local and I'm the site director uh, within Research Park for the Cargill Innovation Lab at UIUC. In a nutshell, I have the pleasure of getting to work with students to do digital prototype work, but more broadly, that program is a part of our talent pipeline to try to find the ne next round of STEM leaders within our org. Um, you know, when we, we were preparing and organizing our thoughts for this talk, um, something really stood out to me when thinking about this panel and my own personal journey. Ag tech talent is really, really hard to find. Good ag tech talent is really hard to find. I come from a startup background. I um, amazed Laura when she learned that I was moving from Austin, Texas to come to Champaign, Illinois to be a part of this scene. And um, you know, when I look around even the broader team I'm part of, there are many, many tech professionals with stellar skills but they have an ag literacy problem. Um, you know, a, a quick joke to ho hopefully break the ice with the room as we transition from lunch. Uh, when I first started this program um, within Cargill four years ago, and I started going into the engineering quad part of campus and said, hey, how are you doing? I'm, I'm Jen, I'm here with Cargill. Um, have you heard of Cargill before? And you know, our, our top five CS students would kind of head tilt and their eyes would squint and they go, yeah, I do have a Carhartt hat. <laughs> and, and my response was, Actually, that's partially true because most Cargill people do wear Carhartt hats as well, but in fact, that is not the organization that I'm representing here today. Um, but in all seriousness, um, even within students in our lab, um, coming from tech background, aspiring to work at the Amazons and the Metas and maybe the Teslas of the world, and if I ask them, hey, did you grow up in a rural community? Have you stepped foot on a farm in the United States? Very few hands go up in the air. Um, for uh, fellow tech peers that might feel like I'm picking on you as we commence this talent pipeline talk, I also would like to pivot to uh, thinking of uh, professionals with ag domain expertise. 
Um, a lot of ag professionals industry-wide also may struggle um, when it comes time to our digital or our data acumen. Um, you know, a, a silly story uh, within some of the prototype work that I do within our lab, uh, I was working with a poultry leader based out of, out of Canada, and he has stellar experience um, as far as poultry facilities and uh, doing really transformative work within Cargill. We were working on an app as far as migrating stuff that was written on paper as far as records into a digital based experience. And I started utilizing my common tech jargon about uh, dummy data, and I saw his face pale, and he, he believed I had just critiqued him. Or um, even for UX or design professionals, flowing lorem ipsum on design uh, prototypes. And um, a member of the team asked me, why the heck was I building software uh, for people that speak Latin? <laughs> um, so the, these are things, as we reach across the bridge from both sides of the fence, um, it's really hard to find ag tech talent. And then more broadly, hopefully throughout today, we can explore some ways to try to bridge that gap. And Laura, did you have some um, follow-up comments as well, specifically from your organization? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks again for letting us come here today to talk about all of the changes we need to be making in this space to make sure we do have the right layer of tech talent. You know, when I talk to my kids about my job and they ask me what I do, it usually goes towards, well, I, I put the tablet in the cab of a tractor. But I think we all know it's a lot more than that. Not only is it the tablet and the tractor and everything that it can do for the farmer, but it's all the data that it collects. It's all the data that it transmits. It's all the data that it processes to actually turn into that value stream and where that customer, where that farmer can make those changes with the technology. So we need to talk a little bit about how can we create more of a buzz around the need for technology within agriculture. We can do this in a number of different ways, and I did this accidentally several months ago in an Uber ride to the airport. We were driving by a cornfield, and I was talking to my driver about what I do, and he didn't even know who CNH was. So I was like, oh, well, you know, red, blue tractors, combines, and he's like, oh, okay, yeah, I think I've seen those things working on the side of the field. He's like, well, what does technology have to do with it? And I said, well, will you think about a stalk of corn, right? And the combine will take that stalk of corn, it'll process it, and it will spit out individual grains of corn. And he got to thinking about it a little bit, and he's like, you know what, you're right. I never really thought about that before. How do we get the food? What work goes into it? What technology goes into it to actually get something that we can consume? And then we talked about all of the technology that goes into the decisions that are made from like an automation perspective to make sure that yield is as high as possible. You know, over the course of 20 seconds of harvesting, that combine can be making millions and millions of choices to make sure we have that optimal setting for the conditions that it's in. That's where this technology really comes into play. And what I hope is that that guy went home and he talked to all of his friends about all of this technology that's in all of our farm equipment. And then those friends will talk to other friends about these awesome opportunities, these awesome challenges, the awesome problems that we get to solve over in the ag industry. And that will ultimately bring more people back, bring more interest in solving these problems, bring more talent based on the buzz that we can create just talking about how excited we are about this job. Maggie, from the, the VC venture capitalist perspective, um, you know, can you maybe talk a little bit about how the um, uh, greatest need for ta uh, talent is really impacting or how you're impacting that talent ecosystem through the VC approach? Yes, um, and thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. They did let a badger on the panel. Um, <laughs> I drove down from Madison this morning. Um, but I'm Maggie. I'm with Generator, which is a venture fund and startup accelerator. We are headquartered in Wisconsin, but we have the privilege of working very closely with many people in the room, including Research Park, um, Carly with the County EDC, Sarah Ventures on an ag tech accelerator. Um, and so we have you know, done investing over the last couple of years 
are specifically in ag tech companies here in Champaign, which is wonderful. So um, a lot of things, Jen, that you said really resonated with me. I'm like sitting here just like nodding. Um, really both both of you, because I think we see a similar dynamic on the startup side where you, you need the tech side and you really need the ag side to make anything work um, because everything um, is tech supported. You need the people with those skills. But if they also don't have that personal experience or the emotional intelligence to understand when you're asking a grower even to pilot something, like what are you really asking of them? And what is that experience like? You're, you're not going to be able to make it work. Um, and so I think there's really something to that uh, translation. And that's why events like this are so exciting when you can bring a lot of different groups together um, and make those uh, collisions to find um, that harmony. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And I do think it's something um, that the venture community helps with in terms of just bringing together these disparate groups and creating collisions and, and validating what the problems are. The other thing that resonated with me, Jen, is we have the same, um, you know, I think Madison and UIUC are similar, and we don't have that like Stanford MIT default, like, oh, I'm gonna, when I graduate, I'm gonna start a company. We're gonna go to Amazon, we're gonna go to a Fortune 500, um, and maybe it's not in ag necessarily by default. And so I think there is a critical moment of intervention, and whether that's, hey, you should really look at this industry for your talents, there are big problems and really exciting challenges to solve, or, I mean, before your uh, sort of status of living changes, like try out a company. Um, so whichever path it is, I do think as a community, recognizing that there is that um, moment when these really incredible, talented people are here to have those conversations and to um, explain what the potential is. Um, and don't go to Amazon. <laughs> Thank you. You know, one of the things uh, that several of you mentioned is this duality of needs between an understanding of ag plus the understanding of tech. And so um, maybe to follow up on some of your comments, um, I'm going to turn this one over to Amy. And maybe you can talk with us and, and share a little bit about um, the foundation that you're working with, what, the, what you're doing to work with youth to help expose them to both worlds. Okay. It's nice to be here. So as was noted in the beginning, I work as part of the Jackie Joyner Kersey Food, Ag, Nutrition, Innovation Center. It's a mouthful, so we say JJK fan. I do want to know that this is a partnership since we are at the University of Illinois with the University of Illinois, as well as the Donald Danforth Plant and Science Center in St. Louis and the Jackie Joyner Kersey Foundation, which is an after-school-based site for K through 12th grade, as well as an eight-week summer program for youth in the city of East St. Louis. I'm a poor replacement for Jackie Joyner Kersey for those that are familiar with who she is. I'm sure Laura is as a previous track runner. Uh, she held several uh, medals in the Olympics uh, for her record in track, but she's also highly committed to offering or to developing opportunities for youth in the community she grew up, which is the city of East St. Louis. Um, so specific to, you know, the panel and, and listening to the sessions here today, a lot of the discussion was on retention, recruitment, you know, specifically recruitment. You have to recruit them before you retain them, right? Um, but really what we're looking as part of this partnership is on development. And what does development look like? And I'm really going to challenge the audience from the standpoint of what does development of talent look like with diversity, equity, and inclusion? And that really is what this project is about. It's connecting youth to, in an underrepresented community to opportunity. And Jackie's extremely passionate about it. And she's passionate about it because if you're not familiar, she was an asthmatic and she had to, and diet was an important role in her performance as an athlete. So the JJK fan is really this fusion between athleticism, which sounds strange, and then food and nutrition, but what creates food and nutrition? And that's agriculture, and what creates opportunity for youth? I, I was just so blown away with the depth and breadth of this sector as I sat here today. I am not an ag leader at, as the beginning. I get the, I'm blessed to work with a lot of ag leadership that are in this room, Kim Kidwell being one of them here today. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to do here and what I task you is to look at how do you work to develop talent with that diversity inclusion lens. And in the city of East St. Louis, there's barriers to these kids to even 
Um, you know, many of your companies offer things like internships, but those are often not accessible for the kids in our community because they're relying upon public transit. So when you look at, you know, not just from a standpoint of developing talent maybe at the college level, how can you work with institutions like the Jackie Joyner Kersey Foundation to develop talent starting in kindergarten? Because I think what I was struck here today, and you know, just talking about the hat, you know, it reminded me, kids hear about doctors, they hear about policemen, they see policemen and firefighters, but do they hear about you? And how do we change that? Because 25,000 jobs go unfilled a year nationally in the ag tech sector. That's from the Purdue report that comes out of USDA. Why? Are ki why aren't kids embracing this sector and seeing it as an opportunity for them? But it's even more difficult for African American children in this country to see this as a place for them. But I think that's what the Jackie Joyner Kersey Center is trying to change, and I think we have a real shot at it. And so um, I'm just glad here to be here today and, and say we welcome you helping us build this over time. I, I think everything you're, you're talking about is so important to build the, the pipeline of uh, students, young students who have an interest in ag and then pursue that in, in you know, whether they go straight out of school, uh, high schools into agricultural kinds of roles, two-year colleges like we were uh, talking about Parkland's uh, uh, and, and AGCO's connection today, um, but then four-year schools, right? We, we want our students to uh, pursue agriculture as, as careers so that they can then fill the roles that you all have available. Um, and so the work that you're doing is really, really important to, to create that interest and awareness. Um, and, you know, as we're building those pipelines, and we get the students here on, on our campus, um, our students do have opportunities then to get some hands-on experiences through different ways. Research Park is one of those ways. Um, and so I was um, maybe gonna turn it over to Jen next. Maybe you could share with us a little bit about some of the um, engagements and projects that you're working um, with our students on. Sure, uh, so many site directors across the park, myself included, um, we have internship programs. Um, but one thing that I didn't know before really stepping into this ecosystem is uh, the new face of internships is wildly different from the sad one internship I had the privilege of not getting paid to do when I was an undergrad <laughs> many years ago. Um, but but with these modern internships, it's not just embedding a student in a part of a business and crossing our fingers that they're going to like it and we're going to like them and everything will work out rosy. Um, it's immersive experience where we're putting students in project-based engagements that add real value. Um, in the lab that my peer Ben and I co-lead, um, our students are working on actual innovation projects, actual R&D projects. Um, they're clustered in cross-functional teams and they're paired with practitioners that have been there and done that and can try to guide them along the right path. Um, so I would just encourage whether you are, I, I've been there as far as being scrappy small startups, um, in, in thinking of some of the other peers in the room to now being at the largest privately owned company in the United States with 160,000 employees around the world in 70 countries, if I got all those Cargill stats correct. <laughs> but, um, you know, whether you're big or you're small, um, universities can offer a myriad of opportunities, but the opportunity to embed students in the project-based work um, and treat them truly as a, a full-time employee um, is a win-win for the student as far as gaining those skills, um, those hard skills and soft skills, um, and then also to help companies uh, move forward our objectives. And, and if I may, one other um, element in regards to changing the face of our teams and reaching out to new communities, um, as, as Amy referenced, um, International Women's Day is coming up tomorrow. Um, I, I had an opportunity to connect with other Cargill women in tech about um, some of their unique uh, recruiting strategies as far as to um, change the face of who and the composition of these teams. Um, for global organizations, the talent needs are very different market by market. It, for some of my peers in Costa Rica, uh, women representation in tech is very low, and then actually a barrier to entry are certification programs. Um, so uh, Cargill employees in that particular market partner with nonprofits like Rocket Girls as far as providing mentorship at um, elementary youth age um, to show we're women, we're in tech, 
here are the accreditations you need to get, and guess what, I'm going to mentor you to get you there. Um, or even returning to workforce. Peers in our Bangalore office uh, started a new program within Cargo called MOMO. Um, motivated Mothers is what that represents, as far as encouraging women stepping back into their career to decrease some of that friction of taking those first steps to get, get back into uh, picking up um, wherever they pause their career at that point in time. Um, so I, I just wanted to highlight those, for example, as um, you know, so, some other uh, profiles of programs that are creative recruiting strategies uh, to ensure that we have inclusive teams as well. Great, and, and I, when we were preparing for this panel, um, one of the things that Laura actually talked about that really um, stood out to my mind was what makes for great employees in um, the ag industry, right? Um, and um, maybe you can comment a little bit about, uh, kind of from, your, from our discussion, what you really feel makes for a great employee and what their backgrounds and, and um, skills are. All right, so I will say what makes a great employee is really two things, and they are completely not related to ag. And then I'll put it back to the ag portion. Um, after many, many years of thinking about it, I have come to the conclusion with many, many of my coworkers that there are two things that make a great employee. Number one, you do what you say you're gonna do. And number two, your gears are turning while you're doing it. You're thinking it through. You're wondering, should I be doing it this way? Should I be doing it that way? Maybe I should ask a question about it. Those are at the core level and they are very independent from ag. So as we think about ag technology and how do we get more people to apply to these jobs, we can really think about that core skill set. What do we need at its core to be able to make this position successful? So it can be something as simple as, did I find someone who's going to do what they say they're going to do? Did I find someone who's going to think it through while they're doing it? Have I really narrowed it down to what are the core needs for this job? And have I written my job description in a way that will entice them to submit that application. So we've changed some of what we've done at our company over the past several years to do things like change the way we put verbiage in a job description so it's not gearing towards one specific type of a person. We no longer put in the preferred qualifications growing up on a farm. We know if you grew up on a farm, you're gonna mention it during the job application process. We know that, why wouldn't you, right? But putting that verbiage in there at the bottom may actually deter other people from applying. They may say, oh, well, really, for me to be absolute best in this job, I need to have an ag background. And that's not always true. You really need diversity of thought, diversity of backgrounds to really come to some of these innovative, innovative solutions that we need. So as you're putting those job descriptions out there, consider what that diversity should look like for your team. You know, I have someone on my team that came from a telecom industry. They came from a, a cell phone carrier. They didn't know a thing about agriculture when they came in, but they knew a heck of a lot about data, how it was transmitted, what was important for a cellular carrier, carrier what should be important for a consumer when it comes to that connectivity. And they were able to apply a lot of that knowledge that they had around connectivity to an environment that was brand new for them. You're out in the middle of a field, coverage is low. What else can we do in this space to increase those? So they can learn quicker if they have the right team to support them, and you know that going into the job. So really focus on how can we change what's in those job descriptions to make sure we get as many applicants as possible so that we can get as much diversity as possible that will lead us to those innovations. Oh, that, that's great, and yeah, like you said, a lot of those um, attitudes are what makes for great employees, but we do have this duality of needs in tech and um, agriculture, and um, uh, the, the pool of uh, applicants doesn't always match the number of positions that we, want, we have available. Um, and so um, it'd be great, Maggie, if you could share from Again, your perspective on how you're bringing together talent um, in ways that can solve problems uh, that they come from those, those diversity of thoughts, right? Diversity of experiences, but bringing them together in the same room. 
Yeah, and I, I think it's um, the intentionality around it, I think, is key. And that's something um, for our own company. So we've grown. I was the second employee. We're now 120 people. So your description really resonates. We're always looking for super capable people who have demonstrated that they can work really hard and make something out of nothing. It doesn't really matter if it's been in venture capital or with startups because we're confident we can train them in that. And so I, I do think it's, but knowing that, we're, that we will need to train them and sort of bring them along, I think is key. And that's something that I think is relevant to this conversation. Um, could you repeat the question you directly asked me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, it was just, um, if you could share some of the programs or approaches that you as a VC have to bring together diverse uh, groups of, of people and backgrounds, whether it's technology or agriculture or other industries. Yes, thank you. So I think um, two things come to mind. So one, I would say, is just the benefit of an accelerator and a VC is um, what we've intentionally built is a very wide network of a lot of different kinds of people. Um, because if you're starting a company, you need a lot of wide network and a lot of people to help you. And so I think um, for startups, for example, that are in our programs, it's a really big deliverable for us is introducing them to a lot of different people who can provide perspectives on a lot of different things, because usually there are two or three or four people. So that's sort of like built in and a given. Um, and in our case, a lot of the people that we want to talk to are the types of people who are sitting on stage here who have sort of that corporate experience. They might be a potential partner. Um, and certainly in the ag tech space, people um, who uh, grow our networks as well. Um, one thing that we do, and I, you know, we are saying this in terms of just um, kind of the skills question and, and how it's relevant from a venture perspective, um, we run a conference that intentionally connects startups and corporations and venture capitalists in um, a very structured sort of speed dating format. And the whole goal, again, is to allow these startups to validate that they're solving a really big problem. And so I do think um, that the skills and kind of pipeline question is one that I'm, we're seeing uh, startup founders look at in a wide variety of industries. We actually have an entire conference around workforce development and innovation. And I do think hopefully we'll see more people tackling this in this particular space. Thank you. Um, Amy, I'm going to have you start with this one. Um, is you're talking about the youth programs that you have. Can you tell us a little bit about the approaches that are be being taken with your programs to build the talent pipeline? Yeah, thank you. Um, so really, when I say we're starting with exposure, some of that starts with offering programming. We have three educators that represent three of the organizations providing various plant science, STEM-related programs, uh, incorporating technology within those programs. Probably our most popular with the teens, if I'm being honest, is drones. So when we get into precision ag, uh, <laughs> uh, that's a fun one. It seems to really resonate with the youth, anything related to technology. Uh, we find that's a sweet spot as we try to connect with the teenage population. Uh, in addition to that, we have we currently are operating in a greenhouse, three different aquaponic systems that you would see commercially used uh, in indoor agriculture that we utilize as a teaching tool for the youth. Um, and also, this is also a food access in initiative. I would be, um, you know, I would not be doing this project. I would be doing the project a disservice if I did not mention that East St. Louis is a food desert. 86% of the population lives with low access and low food security. Um, so all the food that these kids help grow gets donated to the community or utilized in their programming. So they're getting an opportunity to not only plant the food and utilize uh, you know, aquaponics. It's a great learning tool. Fish are also an enticer for kids, too. One of the reasons why we've erred on that versus hydroponics. Um, but then they also get to see what the food can be used for from, you know, from a standpoint. They made lip balm one day. Um, so really what we're trying to do is make ag relevant to them and the space in which they live. And so right down to plants they want to grow. Uh, so, you know, we grow greens in our greenhouse. Um, we're very strategic about what we plant. We want to make sure it lands and resonates with the community we're serving. Um, and so the youth are part of that decision making. So that's one aspect to really make them feel as though they are part of this system, part of this work, and they can see themselves starting at a young age. These kids are coming to the greenhouse starting in kindergarten. 
Um, in addition to that uh, exposure piece, when it comes to career exposure, uh, we have been uh, blessed to have, uh, I don't know if he's here, Blake with Bear. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call him out because he came with, you know, Bear has uh, diversity, I believe, is one of their values. And he came to us and said, hey, we want to find a way to work with your kids. And we're open. Um, we're open, we'll be patient, and that's what we need. It's an after-school-based site, so it gets a little squirrely on any given day as it relates to that environment. And we have about 180 kids a day, average daily attendance, that come there. So right now, what we do is we do monthly uh, career exposure days for the youth so they can learn about someone. And sometimes it's someone from HR with Bear, Because the reality of it is there's tons of positions supporting what you do each and every day that might be outside of STEM. Um, but ultimately, what we want to develop is a pipeline of students that want to be in science and math. And because the reality of it is, and I'm actually going to mention uh, BioSTL in our region that has done a pretty impressive report on the status of, of talent in the, in the St. Louis metropolitan area, one of the biggest cited barriers or reasons why in terms of from a, a talent pool, uh, basically not having the talent available for positions is the lack of number of individuals that, of youth that are going into STEM. Um, that's not happening. And the question we have to ask is why? And so what we are doing is we're very, being very intentional on how we, how we basically work with students, and it's got to be hands-on. So no charts. And, you know, I can't take credit for this, uh, this description uh, with Donald Danforth. Uh, her name's Chris callis Duell. She often will say, give the description of the fact that when we teach basketball, uh, do we give the kids a bunch of charts? Do we do a PowerPoint first before we teach them how to play basketball? We don't. But we do do that with science. We give them a worksheet. We give them a bunch of words to define. So when we talk about ag and tech literacy, how do we make that relevant to the spaces that our youth are in? Um, and can we start doing it in a way like we teach basketball out in the field? So that's the approach we're taking as part of this program. And then we're trying to deepen that relationship with institutions like Bayer, and, and there's others that have approached us on developing mentorship and internships. Um, so that is how we are trying to create that pipeline so that when they get to, when they graduate high school, there is that intrinsic interest and desire to want to explore opportunities in your space because they've had the exposure, but they've also had an environment that's safe for them to explore and feel like they belong. And that's also another important factor in their own backyard. They don't have to leave it to learn these things. And I think that's really important to what we're doing. So much of what you said um, can just, I could just ask a million questions going, going in deeper and deeper. But one of the things that really stood out was the partnership with corporate to expose students to STEM, to agriculture, um, and frankly, to build the company's brand with these youth so that when they are looking for jobs, uh, they, they recognize who the, a particular company is. And Jen, you mentioned this as well, even coming here to job fairs and um, having students or meeting students who don't know who Cargill is. So maybe um, following, taking that the next step, Jen, could you tell us a little bit more about some of the action learning, um, uh, experiential learning activities you're doing to help students understand what it is that Cargill does? Yeah, what, one example that in thinking of also some um, fellow panelists up here, um, Something that surprised me that's actually worked quite well for us. So we too have partnered with uh, an accelerator out of uh, the Minneapolis market. Um, I won't name them out of respect for my <laughs> venture peers here, but um, they, they, felt they have a farm to fork accelerator. Startups participate, they gain mentorship. Um, outcomes of that are stories we can tell as an industry that excite and engage potential early career professionals to join us. Um, the, the projects I do within our lab or even within our R&D team, often we can't talk about them externally. And that makes it really tricky and tough as far as peaking the interest and exciting uh, 
a 19-year-old CS major that is contemplating potential markets to go into, and they have a perception often that, you know, ag, ag might be a little bit sleepy or ag might be a laggard, and um, until someone is within our lab, that's when I can really peel back that onion and break into a lot of the really interesting um, things that we are doing in-house. But in fact, I mean, Cargill's partnership with Ecolab to co-sponsor and accelerator has been amazing because we are then curating and being associated with the startup innovation scene in the food tech and ag tech space which helps me, I, I even support when we have strategic hires high up on our corporate ladder um, within a, a team within global IT. And um, it's very difficult when you're trying to convince someone to leave, you know, um, connected apparel or connected sleep or uh, Samsung smart things and position Cargill as being the place that you can actually keep doing those things and having publicly referenceable programs through some of these partnerships is that candy that all of us as professionals in ag sometimes really need as far as um, being able to flip the switch um, in a CS major's mind about this is actually um, not only an industry that you can be fully engaged and excited to work in, um, but quite frankly, often uh, you know chase those use ca cases that really matter um, as well. Laura, can you share what, what you're doing within your organization to build the talent pipeline? Yeah, absolutely. We know that the talent pipeline is what we really need, not tomorrow, but the five years, the 10 years, the 15 years from now. And the way we can start to do that is building on yours is piquing that interest. You know, myself, I grew up, I'll call it ag adjacent, right? I didn't grow up on a farm, but I had a cornfield in the backyard. My grandparents had farms. So I always rode in tractors with my uncle. I climbed in the hay barn with my cousins. And when it came time for me to look for a career in a particular location near Chicago, looking at CNH was just obvious for me. I knew what was there. I knew what the challenges were. I knew that was somewhere where I could make a difference. But if I didn't grow up with that experience, I wouldn't have that in mind. I it wouldn't be natural for me to look for those jobs. So if we start to place some of these challenges to pique the interest of early education, of early college, to get them thinking about the problems in front of them in, a, in an ag flip, that can start to build some of that ag acumen that we need in this space. You know, one of my favorite challenges to think about that's global but it also pains the ag industry a little bit, is the natural shift in tectonic plates. So if you're familiar with this from a GPS perspective, the tectonic plates can shift 0.5 to 4 inches every year. So repeatability from a field boundary, from a guidance line perspective, you might be fine year to year if your plates shifted you know, 0.5 inches. But think about this 10 years from now and how much that could have shifted. This is a lot of why people will not offer the year-over-year -year repetition, a guarantee that your line last year will be good enough for you this year. These are real problems. When you think about it from an agriculture perspective, can really start to build some of that intuition, can start to get these people thinking about it in a different way. And I think that's one of the best ways we can start to build this pipeline. Yeah, and I think I'll follow up a little bit on that, um, given that this is Ag Tech Week. Um, we also, this week, have at the Center, Center for Digital Agriculture a one-day conference that you can sign up for and, and get some additional um, knowledge and, and skills. So there's still, if you want to participate online, uh, you can register for that uh, conference. Um, so, Laura, you, you talked about the importance of developing what we call that, what you referred to as the agriculture acumen, right, um, with new hires. And can you share a little bit more about what your organization is doing to develop that acumen in, in individuals that haven't been exposed to it as they were growing up or in, in their careers to date? Customers at the end of the day need to have profitability on their farms. We know that, anybody knows that, that's, that's pretty easy, right? But to build up that ag acumen and, and determine what factors we can change to make the customers more profitable is really where you can focus on developing your employees. The way that they talk with a customer, the way that they try to understand what that full customer experience is, that will give them the intuition. So when they head out to a farm, make sure they're trained on how to talk to a customer in a way that's not leading. 
If we go out there and we say, hey, we just launched this really cool new feature for your tractor, what do you think about it? Okay, that's fine, and you'll get some feedback on what that feature was, and it could also be that they just made up something because they hadn't thought about it yet. But if instead of asking that question, you just observe, you watch, you see if they used the feature, you see how they interact with the feature, you see what that changes for them on the back end, that's where you can really start to understand the core of the problem. Every farm is unique. I think it was mentioned earlier today. It could be a soil condition, it could be climate, it could be what type of crops grow in the area. Every farm is unique. So if you start to understand some of that intuition, some of the core of where the value is for all customers, you can start to develop some of those solutions that really cross multiple customers by just observing, by watching, by knowing how to interact with the customers, and that's how I think we can really build up that acumen. Yeah, and, and I, I think it was referenced earlier in the day today about the importance of actually going in the field and having that firsthand ex experience. So we're hearing that theme multiple times today. Jen, you also um, mentioned some changes or opportunities that actually arose um, through the pandemic. And there's lots of negatives, but there were some positives. Can you share with us a little bit about how that impacted Cargill? Sure. I, you know, one example that I thought, thought was kind of interesting, there might be programs or initiatives you have in your companies that if repositioned another way, they could actually be that special sauce that unlocks that cross-disciplinary training for your tech professionals to learn more about ag. Um, here, here's a tangible example. Uh, Cargill Protein in North America was opening a brand new sparkly facility in the Tennessee market. They knew lots of customers and partners and employees would want to come and tour that facility. What did they do? They came up with a virtual version of it as well. Now, that initially was a one-off of uh, coupled with video content and a nice, you know, engaging digital experience to provide the way to call out key points of interest on that particular tour. But what happened? Well, when I rewind three years ago, around the timing of this, conference, the pandemic hit. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, there was heightened importance on making sure that we are aligning with some of our, of course, like safety standards, um, and that truly having foot traffic and a lot of those floors just was not something that was in the game plan um, during that time period. Well, this team actually flipped that one virtual tour into a virtual tour platform and systematically has been going through cargo protein facilities in North America. So that way, at this point in time, I think we're up to about 12 facilities in North America and there's a, a roadmap of many more to come. Why care? Why, why is this relevant to the conversation? Um, yes, there's benefit as far as uh, customers and stakeholders participating all around the globe. What they found, what even one of my student prototype teams benefited from, when you work on a project and you are just looking at data and tables or spreadsheets, and it's just decimal points and, uh, and digits, it's really hard for it to be real if you can't be there and to see the facility, to meet the employees, to walk the space, but that's not feasible given budgets and timelines. Um, so for us, even within our team working on a demand planning dashboard, um, we were actually able to tour virtually that specific facility that the professionals we were serving work out of and the terms came to life. Um, they went from acronyms and vocab we didn't understand um, as being you know, the digital prototype squad to um, moving forward with a little bit more empathy as to uh, really what were those processes, equipment, professionals, and the hardships as to what it's like in that particular um, location. So um, again, does everybody have budget to create a virtual tour platform today? No, that, that is a formidable um, challenge that uniquely uh, the Cargill team was able to navigate given some investment in that area. Um, however, they're even doing tours within your team today um, in person, maybe that might be a way for also a digital peer on a team um, for that light bulb moment to go off. Um, so there, there might be some great wins as far as repurposing already things you're doing for training for one audience to open a door or have a light bulb moment um, for other professionals within your group. So I think you addressed accessibility of training as well as different training styles, right? Things work differently for different folks. So. Amy, can you maybe share with us a little bit of the differences that you've observed in, in some of the training for youth uh, versus some of the training opportunities that we've talked about so far? I mean, you know, youth's a whole nother ball game, right? Uh, <laughs> although there are similarities as well. At the end of the day, adults are different learners too. 
Uh, we learn in different ways, um, whether you're an adult or you're a child, and you have to adapt as someone who's training. If you're going to be effective, you're going to have to adapt your methods. Uh, one of the things we did see, uh, specifically with COVID, you know, the I know that everyone talks about COVID, right? And and the virtual platform that the world found themselves in. I will say we had communities left behind, and East St. Louis is one of them, because the families in communities such as this do not have the same access to virtual platforms that say. You know, in many ways, uh, in public health, it's often saying that health is uh, summarized in a zip code. The same goes for economic opportunities and education. It's summed in a zip code. And in, you know, whether I understand that um, you can always, you could always, there's always an opportunity in this country, right? To, to that's a, the American dream, right? Live the American dream. But I will say what COVID highlighted uh, in, in very negative ways is that many, for many folks, the American dream is a lot harder to achieve, and that's the youth that we're targeting for our project. And so when we talk about learning, um, virtual, while it is a platform and we explore hybrid uh, ways of doing that, in person is better because we have to think about accessibility and then also think about COVID. For many of us, myself included, I had the, I, I was working for the university at the time. They allowed me to work from home. I will say that the people in East St. Louis are on the front lines of low income service jobs. They didn't get to work from home, which means there was no one at home to help their child turn on the computer and figure out how to log in, log into Google Classroom. So what we are seeing is we're seeing a group of youth that are full of, of, of spark and, and, you know, they're extremely smart, but they aren't reading at the reading level that they need to be or the, are performing at the, the, the math level that they need to perform because they basically lost two years of academics. Um, so when it comes to different learners, there's different learners and youth in, in just like adults, but then there's also challenges and barriers to accessibility for youth uh, specifically that can have long-term consequences. And I think we're seeing that play out in many communities like East St. Louis across the country. I'm glad you pointed that out because one of the things I've been observing, obviously we've been talking about ag tech and I think you know, that quickly gets into like your CS departments and your, your coders and can we translate into ag. But I think the whole entire spectrum of this industry requires digital literacy. So if you're flying drones or like we see so many companies that are starting products to basically do like your on-farm like task list, like all of that from every end of the spectrum requires digital literacy. And so I think um, that is like a, really an industry-wide problem, not just sort of I'm at my laptop coding something. So there's certainly some opportunities in, in training <laughs> and uh, continuing to find ways to educate a, a, the entire population about how important agriculture, technology, and kind of the blending of both of them are. Um, I was getting uh, the flag from, from Laura over here that we have some questions, so I'd like to open up the microphones for those questions at this point. So you mentioned COVID. Question is, how did trends during COVID, such as cottage core and farmers markets, impact new talent in ag tech? As young people seek out jobs that address climate change, how do you look to engage new talent as things like regenerative ag become recognized as outlets to take climate action? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> So the biggest change in COVID to me from a workforce perspective was the hybrid or ability to work from home. I mean, we know, especially with some of the interest for people growing up and the younger generations, they want to work for that noble cause. You know, they want to do something that makes a difference. They want to do something for the environment. Being able to say, I help feed a growing population can be one of those noble causes. We can easily get people to rally behind that. And one of the ways that we've found or we've adjusted during COVID is allowing more of those remote, more of those hybrid positions. 
you know, we all know there's a big tech industry out in California. Well, we now have people that have come from some of those high tech companies that chose to stay in California because that's where their spouse's jobs were, that's where their friends were, that's where their family was. So COVID's allowed us to now group more people in from that remote environment that has allowed us to get more of the diversity from other areas. But people who are really passionate about working for that noble cause, that helps us a lot from a workforce perspective. Great, did anybody else wanna comment? No, okay, other questions? Uh, so the question is, where is the demand for workforce training in your companies? Um, what kind of training? Is it certificates? Is it, you know, advanced degrees? Is it, you know, online short courses? What are their different ways of training that you're offering or that people are seeking in your organizations? I, that is not an area of my expertise within the organization that I serve. So but what I would say is maybe reskilling the employees that are currently within the organization. Um, the amount of online degree is a tool that we leverage internally and the ability as a practitioner, no matter what part of the company that you're within, um, to chase a path to be able to learn about how to visualize data or how to leverage some of these um, um, t tableau tools to uh, gain insights faster and better about your organization um, is something that has been amplified and that there are strategic objectives to make sure it doesn't matter your role, but we should all have certain working knowledge in those areas. Um, so I, I think in turn, the, the LinkedIn learning within organizations for us has been something that was there before, but has been certainly amplified right now to uh, cross train and reskill um, a lot of our, our professionals. Well, we, I can answer more generally. So Generator has actually a partnership with Microsoft around LinkedIn Learning. So we run a, a digital skills accelerator for individuals around the country. So that's in about 15 different regions. About 1,500 people have graduated from that. And it did start during COVID with exactly the folks you were talking about who had no ability to work remotely. Um, and this was sort of Microsoft's way of, of enabling them to acquire new digital skills so they could um, have more choices. So one of the things from the corporate perspective, and I'm interested if this resonates with you two, um, is uh, internal upskilling cybersecurity is actually a big one, um, where there are you know obviously very talented folks on the developer side, but they don't have that sort of cybersecurity um, fluency or skill set. Um, Web3 kind of blockchain is another one. Um, and so there's a combination of sort of more those generic LinkedIn learning courses all the way from digital customer service to project management, to graphic design, to um, preparing for the CompTIA exam, but then very specifically within those corporations, going deeper on some of those technical skills. Hey, um, any more questions? Otherwise, I think um, we're, we're at time, so we're gonna wrap things up. Um, I'm gonna thank the panel for all of your great insights. I know there's a lot more depth that we could keep going and, and discuss um, more strategies to continue to develop in, in a pipeline of ag tech talent. And I know you're all here today. So if you have specific questions that you wanna follow up with any of our panelists today, please do so. They're phenomenal uh, in their fields and we are really um, thankful that you are here sharing your knowledge. So thank you. Are we supposed to say all that?